وسابقت الأحبة في تلاوته وأنعم حين ألقاهم بلقياه ولي شيخ إذا رتلت ألمحه تقبلني من الإعجاب عيناه <تصفيق> Close the door, inshallah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Wa atayna Musa al-kitab wa ja'alna huhudan li bani Israel an la tattakhidu min duni wakila dhurriyyat man hamalna ma'anuh إنه كان عبدا شكورا وقضينا إلى بني إسرائيل في الكتاب لتفسدن في الأرض مرتين ولتعلن علوا كبيرا فإذا جاء وعد أولاهما بعثنا عليكم عبادا لنا أولي بأس شديد أولي بأس شديد فجاسوا خلال الديار وكان وعدا مفعولا ثم رددنا لكم الكرة عليهم وأمددناكم بأموال وبنين وأمددناكم بأموال وبنين وجعلناكم أكثر نفيرا إن أحسنتم أحسنتم لأنفسكم وإن أسأتم فلها فإذا جاء وعد الآخرة ليسوء وجوهكم وليدخلوا المسجد وليدخل المسجد كما دخلوه أول مرة وليتبروا ما علوا تدبيرا عسى ربكم أن يرحمكم وإن عدتم عدنا وجعلنا جهنم للكافرين حصيرا We're going through Surah Bani Israel or Surah Al-Isra and inshallah today we're going to start from ayah number two Last week we discussed the first ayah of Surah Bani Israel in which the Mi'raj was discussed and the uh, story of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu going from Mecca to Jerusalem and then from there to meet Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that was discussed in detail. Today we're going to be talking about something very interesting and firstly Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala starts off by uh, m turning the conversation towards Musa Alayhi Salaam. Why Musa Alayhi Salaam? Because in the first ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam going up to the heavens and talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similar in nature was Musa alayhi wa sallam who was also Kalimullah who talked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. He was known as Kalimullah. So uh, to uh, you know, kind of talk about the next Kalimullah after the Prophet alayhi wa sallam seemed appropriate. And then after discussing Musa alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses the destruction of Bani Israel and the temples of Bani Israel, the great temples, which is a very hot issue in this day and age. So we need to be familiar with some of the history related to the temples and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala foretold uh, the Bani Israel what was going to happen to the temples twice. And this was told in the Quran and it actually happened. So We'll discuss these things inshallah as we go along the historic aspect of it. So firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتَيْنَا مُوسَ الْكِتَابِ وَجَعَلْنَا هُدًا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ أَلَّا تَتَّخِذُوا مِن دُونِ وَكِيلَ We gave Musa alayhi salatu wasalam the book, meaning the guidance, the Torah, and we made that book a guidance for Bani Israel, for the children of Israel, and the, the guidance inside it was Allah tattakhidu min duni wakila that don't take other than me someone as a wakil wakil means someone that you trust someone that you turn to someone that you rely upon this is what wakil means so Allah told Bani Israel that only worship me and me alone no idolatry nothing of that nature this is what is mentioned in the Torah dhurriyata man hamalna ma'anuh the Bani Israel were the progeny of those people that we had carried with Nuh salam. So what happened was Nuh salam, he's known as uh, Adam Thani, the second Adam. Because basically with the great flood, the humanity had been destroyed. 
and he became with the people that were saved he they became the means of the restarting of humanity and the restarting of the human race so he's known as Adam Thani that's why uh, Allah is saying here that the Bani Israel were the progeny of those people that we carried with Nuh Ali Salam innahu kana abdan shakura indeed he meaning Nuh Ali Salam was a very grateful servant servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's mentioned in hadith Sa'ad ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi says that Nuh Ali Salam is referred to as abdan shakura in this ayah لِأَنَّهُ كَانَ إِذَا أَكَلَ أَوْ شَرِبَ حَمِدَ اللَّهِ Whenever he used to eat or drink, he used to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever he used to take one morsel, he used to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever he used to take a sip of water, he used to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's mentioned also in the hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَيَرْضَى عَنِ الْأَبْدِ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ الْأَكْلَةَ أَوْ يَشْرَبُ الشُرْبَةَ فَيَحْمَدُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهَا فَيَحْمَدُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves about the slave that whenever he takes one morsel, one mouthful of food, he should praise Allah. And whenever he takes any sip of a drink of water, he should also praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then talks about something that Allah had told in the Torah that is going to happen. Now the strange thing is that if we look at the Islamic sources, there's not much of an explanation of these verses. But if we turn to the Jewish sources or historic sources, we get a great detail about this whole incident that is mentioned here. So I'm going to translate it a little bit first, and then I'm going to do, talk about the historic aspect, and then come back to the verses inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا We had judged upon the Bani Israel that you're going to make corruption in the earth twice. You're going to cause corruption in the earth twice and you're going to become very arrogant. You're going to make ulu, meaning you're going to be arrogant and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, in a very great way. The first time you do that, when the first time that happens, the first time that you're disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you cause this corruption on the earth, we're going to send to you one of our slaves and he's going to be very severe and he's going to enter into the and into the midst of the houses, meaning to cause bloodshed and kill everybody. And this is a promise that is going to be done. So, this is basically the first corruption and the first punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against the Bani Israel. That the corruption takes place and then somebody comes and he's going to destroy Bani Israel. So, that's the first one. Then we are going to return back the Al-Karra means turn. Now Bani Israel, they're going to basically go through that very difficult time and then they're going to be returned back to their former glory and they're going to then have a high status, good financial situation, good rulers, piety, turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again. وَأَمْدَدْنَاكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ And we're going to help you with wealth and children. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا And we're going to make you uh, big in population. Your population is going to increase. Okay, so destruction because of disobedience. And then tawbah and turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah returns back them back to their former glory. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا If you do good, you're doing good for yourselves. And if you do bad, then again, you're harming yourselves. Now the next time, the next disobedience takes place. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ لِيَسُوءُ وُجُوهَكُمْ فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ Look at the mic. Turn the volume down. It's just echoing too much.
when the second promise takes place meaning the second destruction takes place so that he your faces will be disgraced and he is going to enter the masjid and they are going to enter the masjid meaning the temple just like they entered it the first time and they are going to destroy everything that is up on top of it a very severe form of destruction so again one destruction takes place and then the glory of Bani Israel returns and then the second destruction takes place after that why because they turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Asa rabbukum an yarhamakum it is it is possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have mercy upon you meaning if you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you repent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be merciful and if you return back to uh, being disobedient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to respond in like that you're going to be punished again and we made Jahannam for the disbelievers as a hasir hasir means something that surrounds somebody hasr uh, in Urdu we use this word too uh, that it's something that surrounds you call it hasr okay so hasir something that surrounds somebody and uh, according to the Mufassirin some scholars say it means cradle it means a fort a prison and so on and so forth but we made Jahannam for the disbelievers as a hasir as, as something that surrounds them so now historically what does all this mean after the death of Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam, Suleiman alayhi salam left the Bani Israel in a situation where they are in the peak of their glory. And he built this huge temple which was very majestic and very beautiful. And we know that in, uh, according to even Islamic history, Suleiman alayhi salam he used to have the help of the jinns to help him construct uh, things and to even construct the temple the jinns used to help him and with this help and with this assistance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enabled him to build a huge majestic temple so when Suleiman passed away the situation was that the Bani Israel the Israelites were at the peak of their glory and the peak of their history but after he passed away they started disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they started getting into idolatry worshipping idols and the same temples in which they were supposed to be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they started committing na'udhu billah fornication inside them and using them for illicit activities and for bad activities so Allah sent to them prophets again and again amongst them was a prophet called Zakariya alayhi salam not the Zakariya uh, who was the father of Yahya uh, but a different Zakariya so they killed him also different prophets came they, they kept on killing but particularly about Zakariya it's mentioned in Jewish sources that his blood basically it fell onto the floor of the temple and it continued to boil for centuries and you know while this blood is boiling you can see the blood boiling on the earth this actually the boiling blood it is mentioned in uh, a, a rewire which I which I'll mention in a minute so this blood is boiling and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends to destroy these people who are causing these disturbances and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a bad way he sends to them somebody called Bukht Nasr who is the king of Babylon Babylon which is today Iraq Bukht Nasr Nebu Nebu death Nebuchadnezzar it's a very long name I can't even remember but in Arabic he's known as Bukht Nasr he came and he basically destroyed the temple he sent his son and his son actually saw this boiling blood on the ground he said what is this boiling blood they said well we killed this prophet and for the last couple of hundred years this blood has been boiling so he said that what I'm going to do is for the vengeance of this blood I'm going to destroy everybody here so according to Jewish sources million uh, more than a million people were killed by this person and the temple was burned down 
at which, after which, the blood, it stopped boiling. So this was the first punishment that was sent to Bani Israel. The temple that was built by Suleiman it was destroyed in a huge fire. And after that, these people went into exile. After a while, they made tawbah and turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them to flourish. They became rich, and uh, again, they started gaining some of that same honor and glory that they had before. And then, in the time of Cyrus, who was a Roman king, he called them back, and he told them, he allowed them to start rebuilding that temple, which they started to do. After a few years into building the temple, he passed away. And the son of Cyrus, whose name was Cambyses, he became the ruler and he continued to allow them to build the temple also. After that, Cam after Cambyses came Darius. Darius also allowed them to build the temple. And the temple was completed in 516 BC. Okay, so it was destroyed initially 586 BC and it was then rebuilt 516 BC okay because when you come BC you go backwards the numbers right so you close the closer you come to Isa alayhi salam, it the numbers become less okay because BC means before Christ before Isa alayhi salam. so 516 was when the temple was rebuilt 586 was when it was destroyed BC 516 so basically uh, about 70 years or so later uh, was when it was rebuilt. Okay, so this was the second building of the temple. But what happened? Again, they continued, flourished, everything became good. Titus was a Roman emperor. was destroyed Roman Emperor history of Israel when the
So Bukht Nasr comes <coughs> and he destroys the people, killing a million or so because of their tyranny, because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry, which was something that they were forbidden to do. Allah says this was a promise that was going to take place. Then we returned the turn back to them, meaning they, they went back to their former glory and started making tawbah, starting obeying only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the same honor again. And we helped you with wealth and children. And we made you huge in population. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. If you do good, then you're doing, doing good for yourself. And if you do bad, then again, you're only harming yourself. When the second promise came, the second promise of destruction, so that the faces could be uh, so that they could disgrace the faces and they could enter the masjid as they entered the first time and they destroy everything on it in a very harsh way. So this is the second destruction of the temple which was done by the Roman Empire and which was done by Titus in 70 BC. Okay, so this, is, uh, this was the second destruction, first destruction, second destruction, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes basically to the, to the dot as it occurred historically. If you refer to Jewish sources, if you refer to historic sources, this is exactly what you will get. After that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Asa rabbukum ayyarhamakum. It is very close that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to have mercy upon you. Wa If you basically repent to him, then Allah will accept you and give you mercy. But if you return back to your old ways, Udna, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will return back too. I will treat you the same way and you will be punished the same way. And we made the hellfire for the disbelievers as a hasir, as a surrounding. So really this is the history of what happened to Bani Israel, the Israelites, prior to Islam coming. After that, the Romans basically took over. Okay, now, this is a very critical thing to understand. You know, this whole issue of Israel uh, and the creation of Israel and what the people claim that it's supposed to be promised to them in the Bible and so on. This is actually, historically, it's completely false. After this destruction of the second temple, there has been no Jewish rule whatsoever until 1948. For, so for 2,000 years, basically, there has been no Jewish control of the Holy Land of Palestine until 1948. So the, the question is that if it was promised to them in the Bible, why did it take 2,000 years? In the meantime, you had the Romans or the Christians ruling, and then after that you had the Muslims ruling, and then the Crusaders came and they ruled for a while, and then the Muslims again. Okay, and then after that, you had the British rule, colonialism, and the destruction of the Ottoman Empire. And then after that, the formation of Israel. So all this time, over 2,000 years, why, did the, why were the Jews in exile? And why were they uh, under the rule of either Christians or Muslims? That's the question. So uh, that's why also, if you look at the real Orthodox Jews, that say that we live by the Torah, they will actually tell you that there is no uh, religious precedent for the formation of the country called Israel. They do not agree with it because they believe that according to the teachings of the Torah, that the Jews are supposed to live in exile, they're not supposed to have a homeland, they're not supposed to have a country that is regarded as a Jewish state because of the things that are mentioned here the destruction of the temples and everything. After that, there was to be no Jewish uh, ruling. There's, there's not supposed to be, again, according to them, according to the Orthodox Jewish teachings, there's not supposed to be a Jewish homeland. They're supposed to live in exile. And even some of the Orthodox Jews that do live in Israel, they still believe that they're not supposed, uh, they still believe that they're in exile, even that the, they're living under the rule of the Israeli state but they still believe they're in exile 
but because of the uh, benefits that they get, the welfare that they get, the housing that they get, etc., because of uh, that is provided to them by the government, they don't say anything. They accept it. But you know, if you look at it religiously, and also if you look at it historically, you know, the formation of Israel, there is no religious foundation for it, and there is no ethical or you know uh, logical. Uh, foundation for the formation of Israel. Okay, so uh, this is something that we should be aware of. Having said that, obviously the uh, Israel is there, so we would pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes it easy for the Palestinian people that they get their own homeland and uh, a two-state solution, which is basically what most people want. It is uh, formulated in such a way that both Palestinians and the Israelis can live uh, side by side in peace. That is something that we should hope for. But again, historically speaking, religiously speaking, look at these verses and they tell you that by after this time, there was not supposed to be any kind of return of the Jewish people uh, to rule the actual land. Uh, they were exiled and the destruction of the temples took place twice and then after that, uh, there was never a time that they actually came back and they uh, ruled. So, however, there is a very small minority of people that they say that the temple is supposed to be built a third time. Okay, this is from the Jewish sources. A very small minority of people that say that. And the third time, according to their understanding, where Beitul Muqaddas is right now and the Dome of the Rock stands right now, that's where the, third tem the, that's where the temple was and that's where they believe the, the temple is supposed to be resurrected again. So again, it's a very, very critical issue. It's a very touchy issue. It's a, uh, a very sensitive issue for the Muslims as well as for the Jewish people. Now the Wailing Wall that the Jews actually uh, stand next to and they basically do their worship, this is the remnants of the temple. That was, that was destroyed by the Romans. This is the only thing remaining of that temple. That's why they go to that wall and they worship at that particular wall in remembrance of the destruction of the temple, the only part of the temple that still remains. So again, a history lesson for us a little bit and also a little bit of the uh, you know, things which are, uh, which are happening over there as related to us in the Quran, the history of that it's, it's very important for us, for us to understand and internalize and relay that to other people, inshallah. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq to understand what has been said and heard. They say.